welcome to Chit Chat Money. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer interview industry experts and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Money is a CCM Media Group podcast. Ryan and Brett are also general partners at Arch Capital, and Arch Capital may have positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Money by Ryan or Brett or any other podcast guests is not formal advice or recommendation. Now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome to Chit Chat Money. We have a bit of a random episode, I I guess we could call it. Something we've never really done before. You typically tune in on Thursdays for our, well, sorry, this is a Tuesday, not so deep dive episode. And we typically do at the end of the month, an Arch Capital episode where it's something we hold in the fund. However, we are closing the fund. So as it'll probably say in the title, we're going to go through basically the story, I guess, of the fund, what happened, why we're closing it, some lessons learned. And if you've ever thought about managing money yourself or going this route, hopefully we'll have some lessons that are you're able to take away. Or maybe if you're just interested in kind of a bit of a life update on us, that's what we're going to be talking about today. It's going to be pretty off the cuff. We don't have a whole lot prepared for this, but if you're a regular listener, Chit Chat Money is going to be the same moving on. We haven't totally decided what we're going to do for the the Arch Capital episodes. I think it'll probably just be something that a stock that Brett or, Brett or I is particularly interested in. Maybe it's something we'll own, um, but it'll be something where we're not looking at it for the first time, but it's maybe something we've owned for a while. So a little more of a, I guess, deeper understanding on those episodes. But with that, why don't we? I jotted down a couple of questions here. Let's go back to the beginning of the fund and talk about why we started it. When did we start it? And what was our motivation? What was our goal? Do you want to kick things off here? Sure. I think it's may, maybe hard to. Get one thing for a reason we started it. We thought it would be, I guess, interesting. We thought it'd be a good, I don't know, goal or something to just maybe try. And we thought we could be potentially good at. We also were big. We didn't like how the 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 management or excuse me the fee structures of a lot of the funds out there that we all know. Uh, We're big fans of trying to lower fees for investors, just given that, you know, it's, I I don't know, a lot of the times you pay, you pay high fees for underperformance and you see that time and time again, we thought we could try to enter in with unique model and it was the pandemic. So we were like, Hey, why don't we try this? We get a few family and friends together. Well, why not? And we thought we had a good strategy. Uh, I still think it's a good strategy. And that's really it. It wasn't more of a like, okay, this is what we want to do. Like, this is the one thing we want to do. Okay. We're, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to say exactly why we started it. Maybe Ryan, you had better insp- inspiration because you were the one that I think had the initial idea. Yeah. I think, well, we've talked about it before that it would be great if we could run the fund and do this as like a full-time living, we enjoyed the process of managing investments and looking, you know, kind of, I think most people that start funds are just equity analysts at heart. They like researching stocks. They like finding things that are hopefully going to generate good returns for your money. That was really what we were initially. And we had started prior to starting Arch Capital. So for reference, this is the summer of 2020 that we kind of got the idea to start Arch Capital. Prior to that, we had been managing this, we called it hypothetical capital. It was literally just a Substack newsletter. It was a fund that we would manage together. Um, fake. We had investments in it, but it was really just a liter- exactly what it sounds like, a hypothetical portfolio. And it did quite well. And maybe we we're a little naive, but we thought, you know, we could try to do this for 
ourselves and have a real audited track record and have some potentially invest for some family as well, family and friends. We had some people that had expressed a little bit of interest in having us manage something like this. So we were pretty eager to do it. Uh, The fall of 2020 is when we were actually getting pretty interested in it and started to reach out, contact other fund managers, look up what the steps were to establish something like this. And do you want to maybe go through some of that? Because I think a lot of people say, you're like, there's a lot of reasons to why you'd start it, but there's actual like physical steps to starting it that I think a lot of people are maybe intimidated by. Do you want to go through what it takes logistically to actually start the fund or at least in our case? Chit Chat Money is brought to you by Interactive Brokers, but we like to call them by their ticker symbol, IBKR. Designed for active traders and sophisticated investors, Interactive Brokers offers trading assets in 150 markets with 27 different currencies, charges USD margin loan rates from 5.83% to 6.83%, rated the lowest among margin fees, the ability to trade stocks, bonds, options, futures, commodities, and more with high interest rates paid on instantly available cash balances and the ability to lend your eligible stock shares to earn passive income all on one single unified platform. Restrictions may apply. For more information, visit ibkr.com, member SIPC. Open an account with IBKR today. Yeah, and that is a good point that we did have some people reach out that was part of the inspiration as well. And I would add that we also, at its core, thought it could be a good business. Obviously, there's been thousands of other examples of these type of businesses that work really well and can be profitable from a small business perspective. But yeah, starting it up is, there's a lot of paperwork. You kind of just go down a few rabbit holes of, all right, I need to fill out this stuff. Luckily, we have the third person, Brady, that took that on as kind of the leader for, for that stuff. And he had to do a lot of different filings. Uh, what is it? FINRA, the SEC, uh, filing with states. And then you essentially have to, well, you don't have to, but you really need to it is sign a deal with a lawyer. They help you set up a lot of these fun documents. I believe there's three or four. And I forget the exact names of them because they're all kind of just legal type names. Uh, what is it? What what is like the one that the investors signed, Ryan? What's the name of that? Where it kind of kind of has all the, you know, how the fees work, how, how the strategy the LP works. Agreement. LP I think that agreement. one's the LP agreement. There's the whatever articles and corporation type document, and I mean, basically, we just looked up fund lawyers, like lawyers for starting a, an investment fund, and there was a bunch. We called the bunch, kind of got quotes, talked to them, got to know them, and we found one that we liked. So that process really wasn't that difficult. Uh, but I will say it was expensive. I mean, they do take a lot of the work and it's something they've done before, but without them, you really can't get it set up, at least I, I don't think. And we ended up paying out of pocket. I think it's probably good this episode to be entirely transparent, just so people know what the actual costs are. I think we ended up paying around $20,000 just to get the fund set up. And that is cheap. Relative, we to went for the well, we went for the lowest possible cost. Yes, yes, we we maybe even cut some corners to try to save money here and there, uh, and ultimately it cost us about twenty thousand dollars. We're young, so it's it's a little more meaningful to us than maybe people that have been in the industry for a while. But yeah, I mean, it, it was costly initially to set up, but you also there's other vendors that you have to talk to as well. So you have to have an administrator. Uh, we chose Nav. And they're they're one of the lower cost ones, uh, and that's an ongoing expense. So you're paying that out every month. You have to have an auditor. You have to have tax. You, you don't have prep. You don't. Yeah, you don't have to have an auditor. But you have to have uh, the taxes sh- and stuff. A lot of investors want to see an audited track record after year one, or people look for that, especially if you're going towards like higher end clients. So pensions, bigger institutions, stuff like that, then they really care. Well, do we ever have any experience with that? (laughs) I think uh, from our experience, actually, no one cared about the audits. There were a couple of people, a couple of people that were cold reach outs that said like, can I see like 
auditor sign off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. People that are familiar investing in partnerships like this, look for it, I think. But if you're just family or friends and this is kind of the first time you're doing it, those people cared less as long as they trust you. But yeah, that's that's kind of the process in terms of the logistical component. So how to get things up and running. Let's talk maybe about the fee structure, because this was something that we deliberated over a lot. And there's a lot of a lot of investors do it different ways. Buffett had his way, which I think was what was it? Twenty uh, percent over eight, right? Uh, no, do you remember? Twenty five percent over twenty five percent over six. But yeah, <laughs> twenty five yeah. over six. Twenty five over six. So what that means is that uh, annualized returns, and I believe it's on a like if you go back below, which you never really had a problem with. But if you go back below that, like it compounds every year for when you put the money in. So if you know. If you are an investor with them and you earn that first 6%, there's no fees associated with that. But the excess from 6% to say 20 for a year, so that's 6 to 20, that's 14% returns. He gets 25% of that taken, which is an interesting strategy. Maybe we should say how just the structure is of a, of a fund, because I think maybe might be interested. So it's pretty easy. Uh, there are a lot of intricacies for all the paperwork and stuff and where you have to file the business and where you have to do all this legal stuff, which, you know, makes sense for when you're handling sensitive stuff like financial information and all that. But at its core, it's pretty simple. You just have a general partner, limited partner, partner structure. We have the general partner partnership, which is the three of us that run it. We're the ones in charge of running the business. And then we have the limited partners that join if they give us, say, an investment. Say they give us fifty thousand dollars or something like that. They become limited partners, and it's all one pool of money. So think of it; it's not the exact same, but almost like one big account that everyone's is combined together. And that's really it, right? At its core, it's it's a fairly simple strategy. We don't have we didn't have separate accounts. I know that's what a lot of people do. It's kind of a big choice, and it is the typical you know quote unquote hedge fund structure, but. We wouldn't describe ourselves as that. We we like to, uh, even if the structure was the same as a lot of hedge funds, it's more of a investment fund, I, I would say, uh, because I think when people talk about the like hedge funds, they mean, you know, like Stan Druckenmiller, George Soros, stuff like that. That was not the avenue that we were trying to go after. Yeah. I mean, typically, I don't know how people classify hedge fund, but typically when I think of hedge fund, I think of hedging and we weren't doing any hedging. We were a long only. So I look it up more as purely just an investment fund. The As for the fee side of things, a lot of this was kind of foreign to me prior to really trying to start uh, start the, the fund. But there's two types of fees. There's a performance fee, or there's a management fee and a performance fee. And it varies by state what some of the qualifications are. But for a management fee, this is when you hear the term two and 20. There's a 2% management fee and 20% on profits. So for us, the management fee is something you get no matter what. So right, if you run a 1% management fee over the 12 months or the year that you're managing money, you're getting 1% of the capital that you're managing. We chose to do no management fee. Uh, ultimately, our investors were family and friends. They were taking a chance on us as young investors. So it, we felt a little, I don't know, it felt wrong for us to take a management fee. And since they were taking a chance on us, it seemed more like we would be doing them a favor if we if we chose the structure because they only they should only pay us basically if we made them more money than they can get with the S P 500 index fund. And so that was kind of our structure. And so the the performance fee for us was 33% of outperformance. So if the S&P did 10, 10% growth that year, we did 15% growth, we would get a third of that 5% outperformance. And then we had like the, uh, what was the term? High watermark where if we went down, we would have to catch back up. It wasn't like we would just restart after the next year, like if we dropped thirty percent and then we outperform the next year, it's not like we got to take take a outperformance or performance fees. So, 
that's the way it worked for us, zero and 33. Was it the right strategy? I I am not sure. I think no. no. You don't think I so? Did, I disagree. <laughs> yeah. Too complicated for to explain to investors. We came up with this issue when we talked to people. Uh, I think we looking back, if we're gonna do it again, I would want to do the Buffett strategy or the Buffett uh fee structure, excuse me, of the zero or excuse me, the zero percent fee up to six percent, and then you know, the six percent hurdle after that, you get the twenty-five percent. I think one, so much simpler, a lot easier to explain. And two, from a marketing perspective, it can make people much more at ease with what might be a different fee structure than you normally see because you can say, hey, this is what Buffett did. This is what a lot of other value type investors do. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, it was definitely hard to explain to investors and it was kind of interesting. what the S&P 500 does. No one, you know what I mean? I mean, the, the index people do, but like technically at the end of the day, they actually don't care that much. Yeah, which I guess I thought they did. <laughs> I think we were right. wrong with that. The, yeah. I am, I'm happy. So I'm going to talk about this in a second. We underperformed the market. That's you know probably one of the contributing factors to us closing the fund, but yeah, I'm happy that we didn't take management fees to do that. So especially given that our investors were kind of just really investing in us as much as investing in the fund that they, that we didn't just charge them for suboptimal performance. So I'm happy we did that, but you're right. In the raising money process or the, the capital raising, it was very difficult. They'd hear this zero and 33 and they'd be like, okay, we don't care if you take a management fee, but 33 sounds like a lot. It, it literally, like it just sounded like a lot, but sounds like, even yeah, though to us, sure. it's like, well, it's only if we outperform, it does sound like we're eating away at kind of the performance if you do really well, which it was hard to sell. I mean, that was... That was probably if we did it again, either the zero six twenty five or I think even one in ten, because people didn't really care about the management fee. Yeah, it's interesting where we think I don't for a fund like this where you're looking at not trying to necessarily be someone's financial advisor. Uh, you may even be working with a financial advisor, which I always thought was tough when you have the double layer there. I think that's a very strange and usually not i don't think it's the optimal way to do things when you have just double layers of fees to, to adding on top here but from from our perspective okay we, we want to be not your entire portfolio we want to be a, a subsection of it you're taking a bet on us we want to go after individuals they might you know or families that have a good amount of savings and they want to either take a chance on us we have a separate strategy, which we'll get into, as I'm sure people who listen to the podcast know, typically our strategy is concentrated long only. Uh, we don't feel, I don't feel like a management fee is the right way to do things. I'd rather just get paid and a try to align with investor performance as possible, where basically we get value in the form of a performance fee if we provide value to the investor. But that's not how a lot of people see it. I think the ideal world is to be maybe flexible while you're starting out with the fees you can charge to people, given maybe give them a couple of different options, but it's not always doable, just given the restrictions you have. And I think if you were, because this is different from when you're starting up, like at the beginning, I feel like you want to offer, like you, you want to make it, okay, we can do whatever you, if you like us, we don't want the fee structure to be, uh, something that's in you know that keeps you from investing we want to just figure something out to get you in the door what you're comfortable with blah 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 maybe when you're scaled up and you have a better track record and you're not really like searching for clients you can restrict and say hey no this is what we believe this is what we believe is you know the the best ethically or for our type of strategy for our fee structure you can maybe restrict it but at the start i wish we could have been more flexible on that yeah i agree and it's something else that i'll just mention some people, some of our listeners might know this, some of them might not, but at least in the state of Washington, this is where it varies. In order to charge a management fee to someone or to, to run a fund and take money from anyone, they have to be an accredited investor. In the state of Washington, 
there's a couple of qualifications that someone can have. So I think if, if they have certain licenses, they can be considered one. But the common one is that they have to have at least a $1 million liquid net worth so that that does not include their primary residence. However, we ran a structure that was zero and 33. So we had no management fee. So if we took someone that had, let's say, a $1 million liquid net worth, something like that, it's we're essentially managing for free because the performance fee can only, only be applied to qualified clients, which in the state of Washington, qualified client is someone with, I believe it was like $2.1 million liquid net worth. So as, as young people, you have to assess, I think, what your network is and who the targets are that you'd go after if you wanted to raise money. Because if you have people that are you know, bright, interested in it, and would potentially invest or they're saying they'd invest, but they're not going to qualify, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily help you. It's not money that you could take in. And it's, I think maybe we didn't appreciate that enough, um, that, that kind of, that aspect of it, of how many people are really going to qualify. So we had the pot, we, I mean, we, what part of our strategy, which I think makes sense and having the pod, basically the investing podcast be a way to market the fund in a, hopefully not a clickbait is not the right term, but well, you know, do it ever so often. We we would have these monthly episodes and usually we'd say, Hey, subscribe to the funds newsletter. And usually we get a couple there. And then ever so often we get an inquiry, but nine out of 10 times we would say, Hey, here, here are the rules for an accredited, whatever the terms are, accredited investor versus qualified client, all that good stuff. And then nine out of 10 times they would say, Oh, I don't qualify but I'm interested. So that is something you should definitely consider when starting out. If you're younger or you got to understand who your network is, we thought it would be a bit easier in that regard, but that, you know, restricts us from taking on maybe smaller clients and stuff like that. Okay. We've talked a lot about the fund. Let's talk about the investing environment of running the fund. What was it like when we started? Well, we launched officially February 2021. So it was the height of the growth bubble. Maybe we'll call it the innovation and meme stock bubble. So that was quite interesting. I think from a market environment at that time, everyone was saying, and we'll get into maybe some of the mistakes. Uh, this is a little teaser for that is a lot of people were too hyped up on growth, uh, focusing on quality over price, not caring about price. I remember Ryan, uh, who you were an intern at the Motley Fool and you know we love the Motley Fool we worked there but and you said you learned a ton but the influence they may have is well focusing <laughs> exactly that like right focusing on quality over everything else and maybe not focusing on price enough which i think a lot of people at the Motley Fool and again these are the mistakes we made as well would admit i remember when we were starting you were trying to pitch a company called Procore at like 25 times sales or something. It's a good business, good business. So like, hey, look, that's even, I, I made obviously these same mistakes too. And Hold on. you're like, we, we should it wasn't it public it's a great yet. business. I said it was not public yet. So I said, oh, right, right. It was hypothetical. If it goes public at a certain price, I would be interested. And you thought we disagreed on the price. <laughs> yeah, I was like, hey, maybe 20 times sales. Let's hold the brakes here. Uh, I don't think I was obviously, pitching 20 times sales, just to be clear. Just just to set the oh, I Oh, I remember it was 20 times sales. Oh, I no remember. way. Oh, 20? 100%. Hey, it was a different time period. We're talking about, you know, if we're going to see some now. mistakes. Yeah, uh, but I mean, we're both doing the same type of thing there. So that was maybe some context on the market environment. And... Ooh, yeah. I mean, it's hard. To, we have other question here, which I'm trying to hold back on is, you know, mistakes and what we did right, what we did wrong from an investing perspective. But I, I don't know if there's anything further to go into there or else we'd kind of spill the beans on that next topic. No, the only other thing that I think is worth mentioning here is that, and this is kind of one lesson that I would take away from the whole experience is that if you run a focused strategy, so let's say it's around growth growth oriented stocks, which whether or not that was like our stated strategy, it was kind of where we did the most research. If 
the, the easiest time to raise money is potentially the worst time to start a fund for that strategy because you're getting you can sell past performance but if that strategy's done really well over the last 2 years which is exactly what had happened in our case even though you might be kind of drinking the Kool-Aid and believing a lot of the hype around lower interest rates, lower cost of capital, being able to grow quicker, it's probably not the optimal time. And that really goes for, I think, anything. Like You probably see it with energy-focused funds, how the easiest time for them to sell performance is when they've done the best, which in a cyclical environment is maybe not the best time to start a fund. So it is kind of this weird catch-22 where... You want to raise a lot of money, but you don't just want to do what's worked for the last couple of years. The other thing I'll say here is that having that, even though we tried to run it like we would our own personal money, there is there are some differences between managing someone else's money and managing your own. First of all, you don't have a consistent income stream, so you can't just averaging down isn't quite as easy. Let's say, you know, we talked about the fool style where they they're very long-term oriented, very growth focused. Buying thirds, not afraid to buy a little overpriced at the start, you know, take a little like starter cause, position almost. Because as something comes down, you get your income the next month from your salary, whatever it is from your job. You can buy more if that's come down. With a fund, you have to raise capital. You have to if something's if you're underwriting an investment with with the idea that I can buy when it comes down in a fund that that does not work super well. So, I mean, it's probably not a good strategy to begin with, but it doesn't work particularly well. And uh, we ended up in a number of, really a number of times, having to sell something else in the portfolio in, in order to buy positions that we thought were more attractive, which really was not the optimal way to do things. Yeah. And what was Brian is saying is not like you can't just say, okay, I'm going to continue holding this one thing. You kind of got to look at the opportunity cost uh, of in kind of a closed, not a black box, but just kind of a closed box there. Instead of saying, okay, I'm going to have a few thousand dollars coming in then, and then maybe we can change things up. Yeah. And I guess maybe I'll ask this next one because it'll lead into, I, I'm trying to refrain from going through the analysis of what went right and what went wrong because as the, uh, that's going to be very easy to talk about because it's really easy to remember the mistakes you made. But I guess for context, what were holdings like at the start? I can see you made some notes here. And how was, and maybe let's do just an overview of the performance. We'll get full context here. Didn't do well. We never earned any performance fees. And we'll obviously go through why. But yeah, so what were the holdings like at the start and what was the performance like? Let's start with the performance. We we ran the fund for two years and eight months, essentially. And in that time, so since inception, our investments declined by 20%. The S&P 500 did 20% total return positive 20%. So we significantly underperformed. Looking back at our holdings when we started, I'll I'll go through some of them. I don't know if it's worth going through all of them, but we had Spotify at 17% of the portfolio. Kind of insane. Yeah, I mean, that was back a, on it. that was the big yeah, I mean, that was the big mistake. Yeah, huge, huge error on our part. Um Nintendo was a big chunk that was 15% of the portfolio almost. Altria was 11 and a half, Nelnet was 10%, Sprouts Farmers Market was 9%, EA 9%, Dropbox 5, Activision 5, Match Group 5, Autodesk 3% and then we had 10% in cash. So it kind of it's frustrating because a lot of those did well. Yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But a lot of them did poorly and one of the ones that did poorly in particular, was 17% of the portfolio. So position sizing matters. I think maybe a lesson to take away from this. For one, I I stand by the idea of don't at buying your losers is for losers. What's that saying? The averaging down. You it's don't really to, re- to have it in the back of your mind. Yeah. You don't really realize how how much of your portfolio it was at cost when you do that. 
I think it's easy to forget because it might say it's only 7% of your for- portfolio, but at cost, you, you know, it's come down. You, maybe you put 15% in. Uh, we probably were should recognize that earlier, but the other ones here, you know, some of them did do well. I think position sizing was probably our biggest issue. Yeah. I will say, I mean, Nintendo's down a decent amount. Um, Match Group and Autodesk haven't done well. Activision as well, but yeah, we could talk about. It's frustrating because I guess the individual positions, but. We also another one that we averaged down on, which was probably the biggest impact under performance besides Spotify would have been Wix, which wasn't in the initial portfolio here. Uh, that one we averaged down a lot and it's a mistake. So, yeah, big thing to learn there is I'd say position sizing is something to very much consider. It, it think about a lot and probably just want a basic strategy of maybe everything's also the same at cost you regardless of your conviction ratings and then averaging down you should be wary of it and if you're going to like if you have a plan for it okay you should definitely have a plan for it and rules they set at the start for averaging down but i'd also say maybe invert it and if you have a plan to average down in something maybe it should just remain on the watch list because Right, right. If you're like, okay, maybe we could just average down this thing. Well, if you're thinking about that, it probably means you're worried that it's overvalued. Yeah. The the other thing that's potentially worth mentioning here. The I kind of lost my train of thought, but in terms of portfolio turnover, we actually ended with well, for one, we were a lot more concentrated than Maybe we should have been at the start, even though I do like a concentrated portfolio. But we 50% of the positions were the same as when we ended the portfolio as when we started. The other thing I was going to mention here, and I think if you're a long-term investor, you can maybe tend to forget about this, but it's important to think about what sector the stocks you own are in. So Spotify, Nintendo... Electronic Arts, Dropbox, Activision, Match Group, Autodesk, those are going to generally trade in line. And I know a lot of long-term investors will say, well, I don't care about how they trade in the short term, yada, 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 because I care about the business results over the long run. When running a fund and you're not getting consistent capital in the door, you don't have that consistent income, it's harder to buy things. It's harder to reallocate capital because things come down together. And right, we're trying to make my. We're trying to build a business, and I think you said you said sectors. Those are in different sectors. Factors, uh, factors, some, yeah. factors. Yeah. So over time, and I think we got better about this. We started to add stocks that were very uncorrelated, stocks that didn't, you know, they were a little more liquid. Which, given that we were such a small fund, I think in general we probably should have spent some maybe a little more time looking in illiquid securities where bigger funds can't really oh yeah it's maybe maybe an advantage for us it is i mean definitely i mean looking back hindsight's 2020 i wish we embraced that at the start because february 2021 was the perfect time to be looking at micro and small cap maybe idiosyncratic very you know value oriented opportunities okay so long story short we we held a bunch of tech at the top of maybe one of the biggest tech bubbles of all time. We underperformed significantly. I will say, however, unless you were in the Magnificent Seven or energy stocks, you probably lagged the S&P 500. So yeah. it, it would have been difficult for a lot of managers in this environment. Not trying to make excuses, just that kind of plays into the if your strategy has been working, it might be easy to raise money, but might not be the perfect time to start a fund. Yeah. And Let's, I still think we would have underperformed, but it probably would have been a bit less. Like, like there were some clear mistakes that we probably wouldn't go back to, but I, uh, I still think there's a lot of decisions that I would make today with a lot of these companies. And I still think we would end up underperforming the S&P, but probably not by as much, just given that we generally... Um, 
don't have as much exposure to the Magnificent Seven. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we're closing the fund. We, we underperformed. We're closing the fund. Let's talk about other reasons why we're choosing to close it. What are some of the ones? I mean, the biggest one for me, it's too costly to run. Do you want to go through how kind of costly it is so people that are thinking about this can kind of know what to expect? Yeah. And I would say this is the bare, bare, bare minimum that it costs to run something like this. We went for the cheapest options as possible, which is because we didn't really need as robust of tools. I honestly think we got, would have gotten even to more trouble if we had some of the more sophisticated research stuff that a lot of the big funds have access to or have the budgets to pay for. I don't think it would have made a lick of a difference. But yeah, so we have the the three of us run the same uh, that run the podcast are, are, are running the fund. It was the same three of us. You could essentially think of it uh, if there was a parent company, which there really wasn't. Uh, we, we were, you know, using any sort of pro- profits from the podcast to help pay the budget for the fund because it, the fund didn't make any money. And as you people could see that there's no performance fees earned, we we made zero money. So we had the budget there. It probably was about a thousand a month, but there's you wrote down twelve thousand a year, which makes sense there. Uh, but I, I, there was also some stuff that would pop up from time to time. So I think it was probably even more than that. So we're taking, I mean, the podcast just for full disclosure makes a little bit more than that, uh, amount, but we were taking a good chunk of what we're earning from the podcast, which we work hard at, and it was going to run this business. And there probably wasn't too much light at the end of the tunnel of the next one to three years of this turning into something that can be sustainable on its own. So we thought, Hey, we're going to be keeping, you know, throwing money into this thing and it'll probably cost a lot of them profits that we earn from the the podcast business. Yeah. We would like to keep trying this. It's, it's something we think can work over the long term. We believe in our strategy, but it's just the right move. I, I, I don't really have any, it's costly. Hesitation closing. It's it. Yeah, money. it's just co- cost money. So, it's I mean, the number one thing is money. I wouldn't say it's the other performance. I, you know, disappointed in that, but it's not going to change how I invest. My personal account's going to look very similar to our fund um, holdings. Yeah, I agree. Now, the performance, I, I think it did contribute in the sense that if we had outperformed, it'd be a lot easier to raise money, raising enough money, we could potentially cover the costs associated with the fund. However, given that we underperformed, it's uh, it was going to be quite the uphill battle to get enough capital into the fund to cover the expenses. So that certainly was the two contributing factors, highest cost or, or too much cost and uh, worse than expected results. What did we... or Maybe what did you underestimate when we were starting this? What did you maybe not recognize about how difficult running the fund would be? I underestimated how inflexible you have to be if you have a low budget in what you can revise. Right. We've had we had discussions about, oh shoot, we kind of want to revise the fee structure like we talked about. And we're like, hey, that's gonna cost money that's outside of our budget. So I think I underestimated that for sure. Uh, I mean, and clearly from an investment perspective, we underestimated the importance of paying the right price for a quality company. Uh, you know, we, yeah. we, a lot of us learned that we, we learned the same lesson as a lot of you guys during that time period. Yeah. the It wasn't, I mean, more specifically to the fun side of things, I was, I underestimated how much of running a successful fund comes from capital raising comes from the sales process not just investment performance sure i think if you've like whatever 10x the market over five years you're gonna have a pretty easy time raising capital but there's certainly a sales process associated with this it's not just people like oh you know you seem smart i listened to your podcast a couple times i'll invest money with you that it's just not realistic you have to have good marketing materials, good way of demonstrating past performance. And frankly, you have to be a good salesman and give them, give potential investors the sense of security that their money's safe with you. 
we maybe we were spread too thin, but we didn't spend a whole lot of time as like dedicated to the sales process, dedicating to raising capital. And I think for the big funds, I mean, they've got people doing that. They've got people where their specific job is go out, raise capital. And then you have the equity analysts that are separate. So just if you're thinking about starting it, no, that's going to be a big part of it. The other one, less people will probably qualify than you think, depending on the state rules. And be try to be as honest with yourself as you can of has this has this been like is it just an easy time to start or is it the best time to start is it the easy time to raise money or is it the best time to get some money in the door because investment returns will look good if you're buying energy stocks at the bottom of the cycle it might be hard to raise money but that money that you do raise it, it's going to look really good potentially when things turn and and then it becomes easier to raise in year three, year four, year five. So that's maybe something we underestimated as well. Let's go a little more investment specific here. What were our best investments and what were our worst investments? Well, looking at the initial ones, I would, maybe I'll just read them off from this initial one. Some of these, uh, I mean, Spotify was clearly the biggest drag. And we also did average down a little bit into that, which is unfortunate. Uh, Nintendo wasn't very good. Uh, Altria did well, I guess, at the start. It was kind of an interesting one. It popped at the beginning, but not really too big. Uh, our best one, which is a good example, and I guess our two best ones, because we kind of, one of them we bought and sold twice. Well, I guess Sprouts we did too, but Sprouts Farmer's Market and Dropbox were probably the two best examples of stocks that worked. And you have the notes here. They were cheaply priced, and we had a different view than what the market was implying. We thought they had a durable growth strategy, and it turned out that when you have that and a cheap price and a management team that returns a lot of cash to shareholders, sometimes it works out quite well, and you have a margin of safety on the downside. And then when both these things, you know, we had that thesis on a few other things. And they probably didn't perform very well, but when it works, like with Sprouts and Dropbox, that can lead to pretty strong market outperformance. Yeah, I was trying to th think through like lessons from our best performers. Our best performers, just on a pure percentage basis, were Sprouts Farmers Market, Silicon Motion, probably the highest IRR, and Dropbox. Silicon Motion. It's kind of an outlier here. This was one of those where it was more of a special situation, uncorrelated to the market. And it was merger arbitrage for people. Merger arbitrage for people yeah. that aren't aware. It was merger arb and uh news got announced that the deal was going to go through and we ended up selling it that day. And it was just really fortunate timing, I think, on our part. The other two though, I'm trying to think of why they worked out so well. And maybe Maybe it's not something we'd own forever, but Sprouts Farmers Market and Dropbox, when I think about both those businesses, they were generally pretty hated. So it had had maybe subpar performance for quite a while. Investors were frustrated. They had both gone through big sell-offs. So Dropbox had just consistently declined and people were really kind of writing them off as the tech darling of yesteryear. And Sprouts was... What at the time people seemed to believe a flailing grocery store. Both of them also traded at less than 10 times cash flow and had big buyback programs. And I think maybe that's the big lesson here. And both of those shot up, we sold them, came back down, we bought them. I think my lesson for those two is just because you sell something, don't stop tracking it. Keep a close eye on it, follow the business progress. It might get cheap again. You might get a second bite at the apple. If they have a huge buyback program, you're going to get that margin of safety. And I'm not just talking about nominally a big buyback program. I'm talking as a percentage of their of, market, of cap. Their market cap. Yeah. It's setting a floor. I know that's obvious, but some of these other businesses, it was a different thesis, but I'm wishing we focus more on the big buyback programs instead of the growth orientation but i mean like, said, maybe I'll, I'll hit the maybe i'll hit this point on the mistakes but what i want to uh add on there is a sustainable and track record of consistent 
buyback. So using the cash that's coming into door, the door, returning that to shareholders and doing it in a consistent manner. Not only are they saying, hey, we have an authorized buyback program, but we are actually doing it. So it's not necessarily, a, you know, it's, they can tell you a lot of things, a lot of companies do that, but show me that you're actually going to return the cash. What were our worst investments and what are some of your takeaways in terms of <laughs> what would you try to avoid doing next time? Well, the yeah, you wrote them down here. The big ones, I think probably in order would be from just worst drags on performance. And if you take these out, obviously it's not, it's not an excuse. It's just like, these are the mistakes we made and it's why we did badly. It would be Spotify, Wix, and then Match Group. The biggest takeaways, I would say, are price. Kind of running, valuation isn't just an earnings multiple or a comparative multiple or a saying, hey, it's trading at a sales multiple that's, um, what you might call it, like relative to other stocks at the time, that's kind of meaningless. Relative valuation is meaningless. And really, yeah, because if you look at these companies, yeah, match it a little bit of a rough patch. Wix's revenue growth slowed down, but what we mistakenly made there, maybe that's a different topic, is looking at a period of doing really well, not normalizing growth rates. All three of those, the businesses, I think are fine. Even Spotify's has done quite well, I think. And it's really the price we paid there. Now with Wix, I remember we looked at it, we were like, hey, it's trading at, and at that time it didn't seem crazy, but we are like, it's growing at like 30%. I think you could do that for a long time and it's trading about 17 times revenue and margins are really good and inflect higher here. I think, you know, it's a good value. <laughs> uh, clearly we should have said, Hey, this is a business to watch. Let's keep it on the watch list. It's disappointing because we saw that with some of the probably most egregiously valued stocks, Shopify, stuff like that. And we said, hey, we would never invest in those, but I think we should have just taken that lesson a little bit further, or clearly, we should have taken that lesson a little bit further. Yeah, I think something I take away from those investments is that it's really easy to conflate knowing knowing a business well with thinking you know the potential returns well. The, just because you know it better doesn't have any bearings on the potential invest or the potential returns. With Spotify, we we're very familiar with the product, the platform. We were very familiar with the distribution side on podcasts. We, th we thought we knew the business really well. We obviously didn't appreciate base rates enough or just didn't appreciate some of the red flags. The Well, I mean, we were, we, I, we were right about a lot of the stuff with Spotify. Obviously, they were a little egregious on their operating expenses which we don't need to make this a Spotify investment, but with the stuff we wrote down, we were like, hey, we were actually right about a lot of this stuff, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, Match Group, we knew the products. Wix, we knew the products. Our websites were built with Wix. And we thought, wow, these platforms are really great. And I think maybe we prioritized that a little more than our financial analysis, which is really what we should have focused on. The other thing, and this kind of leads me to what were some of the biggest mistakes, we overpaid. We've talked about that a lot on this episode, that we overpaid for a number of businesses. Frankly, to be honest, like to be completely honest, I'm glad this happened when I was 22, 23 years old, because it's given me a new appreciation for what overpaying really looks like. And it, you could have felt like you overpaid in 2019, but you would have done all right, purely probably because of multiple expansion or low rates. But now, I, I think this is a really valuable lesson to learn early on in our investing career. But my takeaway here is that, and I know this means I might miss a number of really good stocks, a number of really good businesses. But if I'm estimating double digit revenue growth, just 10% plus, I'm estimating margin expansion, and I don't have any multiple compression baked in, and I'm still not getting a 15% potential return. I'm probably overpaying. That's, yeah. I think, a rule of Good thumb. Rule of thumb. It'll yeah. kind of take from here on out. Yeah. And then I would I just kind of thought of this now, but with Wix and Match, 
those are two that we overpaid for. But oh, the Wix, we actually uh, the stock really collapsed, and we kind of made a little bit back by saying, "Hey, well, we sold it for a tax loss harvesting thing," and then bought bought back uh, at a cheap price, made a little bit of money there, which I haven't run the math on, but still lost money as a whole. Both those stocks, well, actually, Wix started working when the stock. Um, how would I say it? Oh, and the like buyback it totally program. got it. Well, yeah, well, uh, combined, yes, the buyback program was initiated. But on top of it, this can happen with ind- individual stocks compared to the market where the stock, for whatever reason, just totally collapses after an earnings report and it goes down like 30, 40%. An example right now, I think, obviously, do your own research, is something like Adyen, where you're like, man, it just keeps falling. And then you combine that with, okay, they're starting to finally buy back some stock now. Hey, turns out that was a decent time to buy. With Match, I actually think, <laughs> famous last words, that could be happening right now. But regardless of whether Match Group works from here, it's a much better risk reward at these prices versus what we paid at $100 a share. Yeah, it's kind of making me... <laughs> I don't know. It's making me wince looking back at some of these investments and seeing the prices on like our cost basis. Uh, yeah. Just, and what's, what's uh, interesting is we, we, we've, we pretty much internalized this in 2022. And this year, I would say for this full year, well, it's been about 10 months. We have had the same strategy where. Or not the same strategies as we started, but we became much more value oriented, much more price oriented. And we kind of stated that uh, for anyone that reads the investor updates we follow, we stated that, I believe, at the start of this year. Either way, that's what we were doing. I think we explained it a couple of times. It's talked about these mistakes that we were making. And the returns this year have been, you know, solid, even with underperformance from not having as much exposure to the Magnificent Seven. So, I think the strat- like this is just a much better strategy to have going forward, and it's how I'm going to be investing in my personal account. Okay, last question here as we wrap up this episode. Would we ever do this again? Would we ever start a fund? Would you ever want to, I should ask? And what would you change? Okay, so are you saying at the same time period or just in general? Like the same exact situation. No, let's say you were 35 years old later on down the road. Is this um, something you never want to do again? Yeah, and I will say that at the same time, we shouldn't have done it again. We should have had a sustainable business first and then uh, gone into this. But uh, that kind of leads into the answer here is I think I would want to, if again, we we kind of said we we're going to build the podcast and the fund at the same time, but in reality, we should build the podcast business first, which has some promise, and get that sustainable, get that giving us a you know a better margin of safety on our own you know uh, company's balance sheet, and then I would be interested in doing it. But I would have to be it would have to be a very very comfortable position because honestly, I'm pretty excited to talk more freely. <laughs> just about what we're investing in and stuff like that. And there's a lot of busy work and I'm not exactly sure I'd want to do it, but those situations or excuse me, that criteria of having the sustainable business, being much more comfortable with the the workload and stuff like that. um, I think you have some notes on that as well. So yeah, it would be a TBD. I'd definitely be interested, but definitely or obviously not at this moment. Yeah, same. Not not for a while, but I think if you're interested in going into this business, whether it's you're starting your own fund, whether you're going to go work at a fund, it's a lot easier to have a defined role. So, if your job is to raise capital, that's your job. Like you can get really good at that. If your job is to manage the portfolio, you know, there there's certain skills required for portfolio management that are different from equity analysis, right? It's yeah, you know, portfolio management specific, specifically depends on who your investors are and what they're comfortable with. If you want to be an equity analyst, which I think a lot of people do, and they just want to f- start a fund, it, there's a lot more that goes into it than equity analysis. So I think if I were starting one, I would want more of a designated role. If I ever did this again, if I wanted to be an equity analyst. That's what I do. Not necessarily so have, have the 
have the balance sheet or the funds like i'm not saying have funds, like the members, money yeah. to, to to outsource some of those functions the 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 I won't call them busy work because it's a lot of important stuff but for the person that wants to do the equity research such as ourselves it feels like busy work yeah and the other thing i'll say is who your investors are matters a ton we were fortunate to have a lot of investors that weren't weren't that bothered by our performance you know they they were investing in us like i said as much as they were investing in the fund they, that was great it's difficult and a little bit awkward in the capital raising process to talk to family and friends it's it it's just a little if you if you think your strategy is going to be oh i've got the i've got uncles and my my parents friends and a bunch of older people that i know that are in the business world that you know might want to invest if you have a relationship with them outside of professionally it might not be the best strategy because it, you know it can get awkward they might not want to invest it might kind of have some sort of an impact on your personal relationship with them you got to keep that in mind the other thing is it i think it's a lot easier to have if you're starting from the ground up and i've we've talked to some other managers where this was the case they had one person ultra high net worth potentially that said i'll kick start things for you with five million dollars it's a lot easier to yeah. do that than to have 50 clients with a hundred thousand or well, have the soft or you could have multiple clients but have the soft commits for the money before you file the paperwork and get things started we started before <laughs> the the money raising we probably should have explored that a little bit further uh looking back on that that's probably a big regret of mine and i'm sure the the other two guys here as well and then yes for the family and friends you're like what we we found is we were like okay well and we were grateful for the people that joined but we had i would say a very high bar for who we reached out to because we wanted to make sure they were people that had high integrity or people that understood the financial world, all that good stuff. Because we were, I think that's one thing we were right about is being very, and we were right about a lot of things with running this business. And I mean, what we're grateful is that we learned a lot of lessons and hopefully get better as investors going forward. But the being very, having a high bar in general for the investors that you accept is important because a bad investor can be very, very detrimental to a fund. I'm sure a lot of people have heard that lesson before. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I would say to anyone that's interested in starting something on their own. I would say, first of all, you could probably do a lot better than us. Don't let us be a discouraging, uh, uh, don't let us prohibit you from doing it. The other thing I'd mention is logistically doing it is more achievable than people think. Like it right. sounds yeah. intimidating, but you just kind of take it one step at a time hiring a lawyer even though it's expensive really helped ease the whole process they kind of put you in contact with all your other vendors suppliers stuff like that and if you have you a don't network, need that large of a budget you don't need some people talk about needing the operating expenses being in the multiple six figures you don't need that yeah unless unless you have a team of analysts bloomberg terminals for everyone the most expensive consultants and auditors you can do this fairly cheaply uh, i say yeah. fairly cheaply i mean it's still expensive but it's not as expensive as a lot of people say so uh but i think we can leave it at that we don't really have to do the, that disclosure anymore which is nice i guess we can kind of finally get rid <laughs> we of that. will yeah we will have to change a few of the things that go along with the podcast i will say i'm excited to focus like more on the podcast it'll probably free up a little bit of our time it'll also be a little bit more exciting to talk more openly about what individually you know we are we're buying doing, and yeah. selling maybe be doing a little debate there and stuff like that uh for example we could do like one of these research episodes like you, you know it could be like ryan's buying x and here's why brett thinks he's wrong or vice versa why brett's buying something and why ryan is hesitant and thinks he's wrong or stuff like that a little and teaser we, here we can, and ultra, we can talk about ultra. literally what we're <laughs> yeah month. that's actually that Brett could actually Ultra, be quite... i'm not as high on it you know we can uh, hey so far you're right but the the price is looking a little bit better for me now because the the discount there is getting uh quite uh is getting a little bit better but yeah we can do that that's a, that's a perfect example uh and 
we can just be more open on like what we're doing in our personal portfolios. Obviously, you know, we still work at the Motley Fool and we have to follow there. They basically do like a T plus two thing where if you're buying on a certain day, you just don't discuss it. But you can besides that be pretty open about things. We'll obviously follow all those rules, but we can be just way more open. I'm kind of relieved about that. Yeah, I agree. I We should throw a disclosure on it that Brett and I, even though we did all this fun stuff, we're not financial advisors. And anything we say or discuss is not formal advice. It's not a recommendation. Thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode. And we will be back in a couple of days with a new one. See ya.